and we are live. How's it going? Uh, my voice is going to be, yeah, it'll probably be okay for a while. I, uh, I got my water. Um, now, for those of you that are following the ongoing saga of my voice, <laughs> um, the problem this time came from the fact that uh, Laura used to be the one that would put all the uh, medicines in my pill pack. And I do it for a month. I got this thing for a month because it's just such a bitch. I don't like doing it. So, I mean, I'm, this is bugging me. Okay. <clears throat> so, <laughs> um, she told me that I re it was out of my uh, allergy meds, and I totally spaced it. And so, I was probably without my allergy meds for, uh, I'd say, about two weeks. And the way I usually notice that I don't have my allergy meds is I get hives. And I started scratching and I was like, uh oh, and I went and looked and I was like, oh, because I remembered she told me, you know, that I was about out. Um, so uh, that caused some allergic reactions. I noticed my, you know, my voice started getting crappy again, but it all falls into um, I learned more from. Let me, let me tell you a little quick story here <laughs> um, about a month ago. I was wondering why, what the hell, you know, <clears throat> My voice, you know, uh, I couldn't sing. I, I had to come back for the most part, but I couldn't sing yet. And I was like, man, this is nuts. And it lasted for the longest damn time. And I still really can't yet. But um, I, I wrote down a note to myself, you know, to contact a, an old vocal coach of mine. Um, now, I'm not going to say her name because then all of a sudden, you know, Freckle Joy will be like doxing her. But... <laughs> um, I, I broke down a note and I forgot all about it. <laughs> you see a pattern developing here. Um, I, I And then as I was sitting here, you know, one day I was looking at some of this junk that had piled up that I was getting ready to throw out. And I was like, oh, I never called her. Actually, I never returned her call. <clears throat> I called her. She called me back and I totally, you know, whiffed on. But I've had a lot going on. So, um I got, you know, I got in touch with her and everything just recently and uh, we got to talking about it, you know, and she talked about how the phlegm, you know, I know it's kind of gross and technical, but uh, phlegm acts like kind of like an oil for your vocal cords. But just like if you don't get an oil change um, when it turns to a sludge, if you are not hydrated enough and you've got a lot of mucus, uh, what happens is this mucus starts to get thick and high you know, and then you can't get it out. Well, apparently, um, the combination of that uh, viral bronchitis thing I had, or bacterial, I can't remember which one it was, the one that I had to take pills for. Anyway, <clears throat> um, the combination of that with uh, the, you know, overuse of my voice um, from that period, and I had a real problem, so I lost my voice for a while. And started getting it back when we realized what was going on was that my CPAP was drying me out. So I wasn't you know, really getting any, uh, uh, I was just thick as fleas, you know, or thick as thieves, they say up here with the phlegm, didn't even know it. Um, so <clears throat> uh, I talked to her and she said, well, she said, uh, how are you hydrating? And I said, she says, how much water are you drinking? And I said, well, you know, I'll drink, you know couple cups a day or whatever but i'm drinking a lot of gatorade and she said oh <laughs> she said gatorade doesn't hydrate you it prevents you from getting dehydrated basically you still need to drink water and you know um i just didn't even think about it so i've been drinking water like crazy ever since my uh i had to you know, realize, oh, shoot, I haven't taken my allergy meds. And this is the worst. I mean, anybody, if you have if you have allergies, this is the worst time of year to not take your allergy meds. It's horrible. Um, anyway, so that's what's going on. Uh, but, you know, we're getting fixed up. I could barely talk yesterday, and this is, you know. <laughs> now, what I want to do tonight. First, I want to check out and see who all's in here because I saw some people I want to say hello to. <clears throat> well, first person I saw was 
Lieutenant Crusher here. Kira De Bruin, how you doing, Kira? And there's Gail, how you doing, sweetie? Tommy Baker, The Rock, the mainstay. Yep, there's Sam, how you doing, Sam? Chicken nugget. Show a body part for money. Elbow. <laughs> um, <clears throat> that, that brings up a funny story. <laughs> when Serenity was like really little, I used to play this game with her that she just giggled and giggled and giggled. I come up to her and I go, hey, Ren. And I take her head in my hand like this and I go, look at my eye, Ren. Look at my eye. Look at my eye. Look at my eye. And I keep getting real close to her. And she just died laughing. And then one day she came up to me and she crawled up and she goes, Daddy. I go, what? And she put her face right on mine and goes, I. <laughs> anyway, hey, Chicken Nugget and Jeremiah Grady, how you doing? All right, Charles Irwin. I saw Charles Irwin a little earlier on the Facebook. Tish, how you doing, Tish? There's my man Dave Al on the prowl. Connie Williams, how you doing? Okay. <clears throat> kind of what I want to do right now. This is going to be uh, what they call, you know, I'm a comic guy. <laughs> I read comics. <laughs> hey, Dean. <clears throat> or I don't anymore. I used to, but I just don't have time anymore. Um, but that's why I discovered The Walking Dead. So, hey, uh, no, I know you don't want, no, we, nobody wants that, Charles. Um, uh, so, um, in comics, a lot of times they will put out what they call a an issue number zero. And what that means is it's kind of... Uh, um, like a prequel sort of thing, but not always. It's confusing. <laughs> anyway, what I'm going to do tonight, um, if people are watching that, you know, haven't been around for a while, um, they're going to, you know, we'll see uh, basically the outline of the Patreon, but also kind of discuss what, uh, brought me into all of this, how this all developed and everything, um, and how I ended up at this point. So um, it kind of serves as a launching point for the Patreon. Um, and uh, that's going to be a <clears throat> at, you know, anytime you're starting something new, you want to make sure people understand you know, exactly what you're trying to do. So that's what I want to do tonight. I want to give you kind of a behind the scenes look at me and what I want to do with this Patreon. Now, this will still be a Delphi After Dark episode because it's also going to follow the path. Basically, it's almost kind of like a preview of the book I'm writing in a way because it talks about how I myself got drawn into this Delphi thing and what it did to me personally and, you know, how I feel about that and how I became a YouTube content creator, which is a massive part of the story, you know. Um, so the one thing that I can say is that I, I remember as a kid, um, you have something when you're studying um, sociology, things like that, they have something called a master class, okay? Now, this doesn't mean if you are in a certain master class, it doesn't mean like, you know, hey, I'm a master or whatever. What it is, is something about you that defines you in a certain way that kind of like shapes your character throughout life or something like that. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> um, the first master class that I think I was in is a child from a broken home. Back in Logansport, when my mom and dad split up, I honestly, because you got to understand, at the time, Logansport was still heavily Catholic. <clears throat> um, at the time, you didn't get divorced. You know, that was weird. You know, and I really think for a while, I would... Um, 
you know, uh, trying to think of a way to describe it here. For a long time, I looked at the world like, you know, hey, it didn't change me that I didn't have a father from that point on. You know, I, I was five or six. Um, so I was put into, you know, the master class of a child from a broken home. <clears throat> and going forward, that defined me a lot. You know, I may have been the only kid in my class up until probably like fourth grade before finally this other kid was like, my mom and dad are getting a divorce. And I was like, whoa, you know, it can happen elsewhere. You know, but by that time, my family was weird because they treated it like it was some kind of disease that you could catch. And I grew up with my, my cousins, you know, hanging out with them all the time. And suddenly they weren't allowed to come and hang out with us anymore. Ooh, you know, we were like outcasts. I don't want my kids to catch divorce, you know? So anyway, but it probably defined me in ways that I don't even know because I didn't, I never knew what it was like to not, or to have a father. You know what I mean? Um, it was just normal to me, but one incident that resulted from that really taught me a lesson and it lived with me for a long time, actually to this day. Now, I'm just going to identify him as Jerry. <laughs> when I was probably in about third grade, um, Jerry was a big guy. He was like, you know, you, you would look at him, you would think he probably flunked two grades, but no, he was just a big kid. Um, and he was like a rich kid, you know, he got to do all kinds of stuff. And one day we were all waiting for, you know, I think to go to lunch or something. And he had this Harlem Globetrotters ball and he kept bouncing it against the wall and catching it and everything. And he kept saying, like, you know, my dad took me to see the Globetrotters. And it was a crowd of kids around and everything, you know, and they're all listening to him talk and everything. And uh, I was kind of bumming out, you know, because I was like, man, you know, I ain't got no dad. I don't take me to see the Globetrotters and stuff, you know. And I kind of bummed out. And I was kind of standing there against the wall. And the, this buddy of mine that hung out with me named David, he kind of, I think he was perceptive, I think, because I think he picked up on it. And he says to the guy, he says, shut up, Jerry. And Jerry was like, like looked at him like nobody could believe it. And I was like, yeah, man, you're always talking about, you know, my dad this, my dad, or your dad this, and your dad that. That's what I said. And the other kids were kind of like looking around like, oh, man, you know, like, wow, somebody's talking to Jerry like that. And then a couple other of them were like, you know, yeah, Jerry, you know, you're, you're dead this, you're dead that, man, you know, and all that. So they kind of started teasing him a little bit. So then he noticed the crowd was turning on him, right? So he turns to me and he like goes, yeah, but Snay. And then he bent down because he was like, and he goes, you ain't got a dad. <laughs> That's what he said. And I looked at him and I go, you take that back. Bow! And I punched him right in the nose and he beat the shit out of me. But the lesson I learned that day is a bully does not like to be called out. And they really hate it when the crowd starts to turn. on. <laughs> so. That stuck with me for a long time because anyone I think in a, in a uh, position of authority that uses that authority to try to silence someone or to try to influence them to do something against their will, I call that a bully. And, you know, I'll stand up to a bully. Guys, I told you before, I've gotten my ass kicked before. I'm Irish, man. We fight to get up out of bed. I don't care. It don't hurt till the next day. And hey, I'm still pretty. So, uh, yeah, that, that was my first experience with a bully. And he knocked me around. And then the teacher, you know, I probably exaggerated. It was very traumatic to me. But, you know, nobody makes me bleed my own blood. That was the thing when he knocked me down like <clears throat> blood. I was like, oh, shit. I started crying there. But anyway, uh, the point being, uh, 
you know, bullies, they don't like it when you call them out in front of people, especially. So kind of safety in numbers type thing. I use that little bit of, you know, infamy from standing up to him to kind of band together some other kids that felt tossed aside and everything for one reason or another. And we formed this little gang and we call ourselves the Scorpions. I I named it after my favorite Spider-Man villain. And, um, you know, we, we, we didn't do, we weren't badasses or anything, but, you know, we patrolled the playground and everything, just basically keeping each other safe, you know, cause we all had big mouths and everything, but it was fun. And it was great because, you know, they were, it was, it shocked me that, you know, they would allow me to be the leader. I was like, okay, cool. So, you know, um, but I had that going like in fourth grade is when it really started picking up. And then fifth grade, you know, um, but then in fifth grade, uh, my mom had met this guy and, you know, we'll call him Kurt, <laughs> which, you know, but anyway, um, uh, and he went, you know, he, he moved us out to like Royal center and then he was going to move us onto this property, um, <clears throat> um, next to his. So we go to Royal center and it's this tiny little Berg. <laughs> I think, I think Sam was referring to it earlier. Um, it's it back then. I mean, it was really small. Most people, you know, they have a hell of a football team these days and they've won the state title like four times in 10 years or something. I don't know. They actually had to go up a great, uh, uh, class level in football because they were one a, and they won it twice in a row. So they had to go to two a, you know, anyway. Um, but <clears throat> there were two things about Royal center. Okay about Pioneer. Pioneer was the country school. Okay. I was a city kid. I was a street rat. I ran around all summer long and, you know, caused hell around the neighborhood. And, uh, you know, I wasn't used to living in the country with cows, like right outside my bedroom window and shit. Um, but I also wasn't used to the country kids, you know, I had long hair, you know, I had this long curly blonde hair because I went to the skating rink and that's, you know, the girls like that stuff. And I was like, you know, um, they compared me to, uh, they said I looked like Willie Ames on that one show. I I don't care. It is enough. I think anyway, um, but that was later, not then. I don't think that show was around then. Um, so when I, was at the skating rink. I was still kind of a popular guy and people still listened to me. And I was kind of, you know, like the leader of my little group, but out in Royal center at pioneer, I was just this weird long haired freak, you know, that, um, talked about weird things like kiss, you know, they wear makeup, you know, and stuff like that. Um, I, I also was a fan of the Dallas Cowboys, which that made me a target because everybody loved the Bears back then. Um, Few people like the Bengals, but (laughs) anyway. um, So I, you know, I had to go to a whole new school and everything. And one day I was like, it was spirit week and I didn't know anything about it. And it was black and gold day. Cause that's school colors, of course. Um, so we, <clears throat> you know, I, I, you, at that time, it was like not wearing green on St. Patrick's day. Um, which there's another story behind that, but, <laughs> and they pinched you if you didn't have black and gold on. And these guys were, merciless like pinching me hard and everything and i didn't like it i was like trying to act all you know like hey you know but this beautiful girl with this you know slightly mocha looking skin you know and these dark eyes and you know dark hair and everything i mean she was just an angel to me 
And she walked up to me and she goes, hold on a minute, you know? And then she like, she goes, you got yellow on your shirt. And she leaned down and she like looked into my eyes and she goes, and you've got black in your eyes. So you're okay. You know, and nobody pinched me for the rest of the day, but I fell in love with her that day. <laughs> um, and I never told her at all. Um, but her name was Dorinda. I still have her on my friends list and everything um, on Facebook. She's one of the very few people from school I still talk to. Um, but I was just crazy about her all through school. And then she got a job at the credit union where I had to go pay my, you know, cash my check and pay my car payment and everything. And I'd see her every week there. Um, and I just, I just adored her the entire time, but I just never said anything to her. Um, but then, you know, that's the, uh, the whole thing that kind of got me into the Delphi thing, because at, when it first happened, I heard about it, but I didn't get to think about it very much because I was doing this open stage thing with uh, this friend of mine, Richie, and uh, this woman, Roxy. And I was, uh, I had been trying to learn uh, silent lucidity for about a month and I got it and I was like, I want to do it tonight. So Richie played it for me and I did it. But when I was getting like, after I got out of the shower and I was getting ready to go do the show, I, the, the TV was on because I always had the TV on and the news was, you know, uh, like six o'clock news on uh, WTHR, I believe. And they said, uh, two uh, girls missing in um, dump fight. Carroll County. And that was like right next to where I grew up in Logansport. As a matter of fact, Delphi, here's what it was. If you didn't know anybody in Logansport to get like, say, acid or weed, um, sometimes, you know, you might know somebody in Lafayette. The Delphi police knew that. So Delphi to us was famous for where you slowed down and, you know, hit that, you made sure you stopped at that one stop sign, you know, <laughs> it may have been a stoplight. I'm not sure, but, um, and you went, you know, the speed limit and everything. That's what Delphi was. You had, it was like a pass through on the way to Lafayette. Um, but I did once go with a girl, that's what we call her back then, going with her, um, that lived in Delphi and me and a buddy, because he was going with a girl that lived like right next door or you know, down the street from her. Um, so uh, we would hitchhike there. Yeah, you know, we were like 15. We hitchhike to uh, Delphi from Logansport, you know, wasn't, wasn't that far. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, you know, I recognize some of these names and everything from Pioneer and stuff. Patty was a big name there, you know, but I don't I don't think Mike Patty went to uh, Pioneer. But anyway, um, <clears throat> uh, I, you know, kind of followed the case because it was a weird thing for me um, ever since I took sociology and psychology. Um, I looked to myself, like how I interpreted things. And then I watched how other people did. It's kind of like a uh, exercise in sociology type thing. And I looked at it and I thought, okay, the minute I heard that those girls were missing, okay. The minute I heard, I thought, oh, they're dead. Somebody, somebody killed them. Why? Everybody I talked to from Logan sport, Delphi, Kokomo, you know, Flora, the surrounding area, they all say, no, we expected that they were just, you know, had ran off to Logansport or something, you know, had like, uh, you know, met some boys and were like, you know, sneaking around or something like that. You know? um, so, yeah, I think it was a difference, I think, between the, uh, the big city mentality that I had had for oh, my hair. <laughs> uh, the big city I, mentality I had since moving to Indianapolis because I had lived there at that point about 15 years, you know, something. About, yeah, around in that area. But I had kind of gotten city fight again and people in the smaller areas, they didn't expect that to happen, but I did, you know. And so I followed it. 
And then came that 2019 press conference. And <laughs> we've been looking for this guy. Oh, no, we're looking for this guy. And it's two totally different people. And that's obvious. And just everything just, you know, oh, we'd like to find the person that uh, was driving this car here. Oh, there's new information. Oh, no, guys, they've had that information from day one. Okay. They called it new information. They had that information from day one. Look at the PCA. Okay. Now, that's a good point right there the trouble that John that Dean makes. Guys, this is the mentality right here. Okay. This is, and that's not a knock. That's what they thought. That's the mindset they have. I'm looking for my other water. There it is. Um, that's the mindset they had in that area. You know, uh, you know, we'll call off the search. You know, might be get, they might even be back at the house by now. That sort of thing. Um, yeah. So, all right. <clears throat> the press conference. I mean, it drove me nuts. I was like, "Are you kidding me? You know, this is crazy. I don't understand this." Um, and I just, I couldn't get my brain wrapped around. What made the difference? What is this new information we're talking about here? You know, then shortly after that, um, Andrew Luck retired as the Colts quarterback. Now, you may be saying, what's that got to do with anything, Rick? Well, I'll tell you. I was one of the people that was not pleased because, yes, he can do whatever he wants. If he wants to retire, that's fine. But why retire the last week of preseason? That really screws the team. Any quarterbacks that were released that were any good at that point during the preseason were already signed somewhere else. You know. Um, yeah, I agree, Jeremiah. He didn't want to be an Indy. He never did. Um, I, I think he secretly hoped they would uh, either pick RG3 or trade the pick. You know. So <clears throat> I was angry. I was upset, you know, and I put out stuff about, um, uh, that's a good point, Sam. Um, I was calling him Princess Andrew of Wuss or Prince Andrew of Wuss or something like that. I think Prince Andrew of Wuss. And um, I put, I, I took one of my jerseys of his and I put it on the porch as a doormat. I took a picture of it, put it on Facebook, and then I tied another one of his jerseys to my uh, bumper or my, you know, that little ball holder thing, and I drug it. And people were like, beep, yeah, you know, and I, <laughs> I drug it around town till it fell off. Um, just stuff like that. Well, Dorinda was not pleased. And, you know, that you got to understand the personality of Dorinda is that she would. There were other times when I said something to someone that I probably shouldn't have said on Facebook and Dorinda um, called me on it. Not, not publicly. She always contacted me privately on Messenger. And she, uh, she called me a couple of times on it. You know, why did you say that? You know, you went too far. You need to apologize, you know, stuff like that. And, um, and I always listened to her, you know, and she knew that. And... <clears throat> I, uh, the Andrew Luck thing, she contacted me on Messenger and she said, um, you know, you need to stop. This is just wrong, Rick. You know, the, the guy can retire if he wants and everything. And I said, yeah, I know, but I mean, he's screwing the team. And she's like, well, what do you care? You know, it's not, not doing anything to you, you know? And I said, but yeah, it's the team, you know? And she made some really good points. And um, I can't remember how we got on the subject, but Something I said, she responded something about, you know, well, you know, ever since everything with the girls, you know, it's all changed with us. And I'm like, oh, oh, wait a minute. And I, and then I remembered somehow there was this connection. Actually, what it was, um, Dorinda's brother is Terry Kimmins' father. Now he's passed away now. But, and I barely knew him. He was just this older kid. Um, but see, Dorinda room, they were my bus, you know, so, uh, 
And that's when I realized, oh, Dorinda is actually connected to this thing. So I told her I was going to draw attention to it. You know, they said, you know, I said, what, what's the best thing people can do for you? And she said, keep it alive, draw attention to it. We don't want it to go cold, you know? So I said, okay, I'll do that. And I went into, I, now at the time, I could not go to Facebook because I was in Facebook jail again. <laughs> Spent a lot of time there back then, but I was in Facebook jail again and I couldn't go to Facebook. So, um, I went to Reddit. I wasn't really, um, hey, support with stuff. Your name's Gail. That's cool. Uh, <clears throat> I wasn't really, um, uh oh, Lieutenant Crusher, where was I? <laughs> Lost my train of thought. Um, see what you did? See what you did, Steph? Support for Steph or did that guy? So her, or support with Steph or that's her fault. She did that. I'm just teasing you. All right. Um, <clears throat> oh, that's right. The Yeah, thank you. So you see, Lieutenant Crusher here. That's why I call her that, man. She's as indispensable to the team as Wesley Crusher was to the first three seasons of Enterprise or Star Trek. Um, <clears throat> yes, and here we go. This is where we're going right now. See, Sam knows. Sam knows. Um, I went to Reddit. I didn't understand it. I did, oh, hey, uh, Alligo Rhythm, what's up? I didn't see you there. Um, <clears throat> I went to uh, Reddit, and I went to the biggest, you know, most active sub and everything, which was uh, uh, Ab Libby and Abby, I think, or I think it was Libby and Abby is what it was called. And it was run by a true lady, ATL. And I started talking with people. I started watching the True Crime Jesus videos with the professor, you know. Um, and for a while, I kind of thought hey, he might be a legitimate suspect, but you know, the more I looked into him, I was like, no, nah, I don't think so. Um, but I was like, you know, going and you know, meeting people, you know, stuff like that. And <clears throat> the first time I really stepped out there was, um, when Lee Kerr came along and I was like, wait a minute here, <laughs> because I had been talking to certain people in the families, which people know now, I, I talked to Dorinda, I was talking to Terry Kim or Terry, Terry Timmons, I was talking to Becky, oh, I was talking to Becky, anyway, um, and, you know, I was talking to Anna. And I knew certain things that Lee Kerr was saying were total bullshit. And I called him out. And some people didn't like me doing that. And they were like, you know, well, who are you to call him out? I said, I, I know he's lying. You know? And I made some enemies there. But then the Daniel Pearson thing. Now, guys, I've said this before. You want to know the person responsible for me promoting the Daniel Pearson theory? You're looking at him. It's me, okay? Because I because I talk about fake evidence, that's still on me. I didn't go deep enough to verify that evidence. And I did not know at the time how idiotic it was of me to step that far out on a branch when I hadn't done that. If all that evidence I had been shown were true, there's no doubt in my mind. Yeah, that's the guy. But it wasn't. It was made to look that way. <laughs> so, you know. Now, there were some people, of course, involved in the Daniel Pearson thing. And I started, you know, I was listening to podcasts and stuff. And when I met them on Reddit, you know, I started finding out who everybody was. But you see their Reddit names. Now I know who a lot of those people were that used to throw harpoons at me. <laughs> <clears throat> You're right about that, Jeremiah. 
um, those people that uh, were throwing harpoons at me, you know, I know who they were, who they were now. And I know who the one that ATL spoke of as the master troll is. I know who was running everything behind the scenes. And it was someone who was playing both sides. And uh, I may save that one right here for a little while. But uh, <laughs> nobody's going to be surprised. Anyway, um, the whole Daniel Pearson thing, you know, we were a tight group and we talked a lot and everything. Oh, sport with Steffi, you want to know what that was? Okay. There was a young man named Daniel Pearson who was at the bridge that day. Okay. Um, he was like surrounded in secrecy and stuff because the deal was he was engaged to a woman that later became his wife. But the girl he was with that day was not her. So he was, you know, fooling around on her. So he was very secretive about when he got there, who he was with, what he was doing. And at one point, I think maybe Jeff Burton might have gotten a hold of what they called the, uh, what they call it, guys? Oh, the linguists report. Okay. It wasn't really what they said it was. They told me that that's what it was. I looked into it. That's one of the first things because I questioned Skip hard on that one. And he kind of peeled under the pressure. But um, to get back to your question, Stefa, um, some people believe that Daniel Pearson was the killer. The motive they believed. Now, here's where it kind of gets tricky. There were actually two Daniel Pearsons that were like almost exactly the same age. Okay. Both of them living in, you know, uh, Carroll County. That's the rumor, the couple under the bridge. Yeah. But they weren't arguing. That's the whole point. Um, they were taking pictures, they said. He said they were taking pictures, not arguing. The arguing thing came in later. We can have an episode about that, but I don't want to go into that too far right now. Um, so uh, some of the evidence that was floating around out there was, uh, well, I don't worry about that one, Allie. I had to go deep to verify that one. Everybody believes they were arguing. It's, it's, you know, I had to, I had to talk to Derek, uh, German himself and that's going deep. And I know it's facilitated by Becky. So, you know, um, anyway, <clears throat> where it started going bad was I posted something they gave me, you know, the skip and Jeff and everything. And it was called out. Somebody said, hey, wait a minute here. That can't be right. That's from such and such email program. And they didn't use that font back then. And I'm doing a show. I used to host uh, game shows like uh, trivia and music bingo and stuff like that. And I was doing a show and I'm getting these messages from Skip and Jeff. You got to take that down. You got to take that down. Take it down. I'm like, oh, OK. You know, so I was like, what the hell? So I took it down now. Couple days previous to that, I had decided one of the ways to get things talking, you know, get people talking about it, was to make videos. And I made one talking to his wife, and I made one talking to Daniel Pearson. You know, we know his name is Daniel Pearson. Um, but <clears throat> the the one to his wife got a lot of people. <laughs> talking about me. Um, that's why I believe it was, who, who suggested that? Was it Rose that suggested I get shirts that said he doxed a baby because they said I doxed a baby. I didn't dox any babies. Everybody knew they had a kid. You know. Anyway, um, I remember um, how much backlash I got from that. Okay. And I thought, I don't understand it. Put it in its proper context, guys. Now we have people making videos addressing Kelsey and saying, you know, what did you mean when you said this or that? We have people making videos addressing, you know, um, Becky and stuff like that. Um, it, it's just what we do as content creators. Now, my content back then. 
um, arguably it was not as good as it is now. <laughs> um, but now I do go into, I verify stuff I put out. And if I haven't verified it, you guys know, I say that. Back when I was getting all the good information, I would tell people, you don't have to believe me. This is what my source is telling me, but I believe it, you know, and most of it turned out true. Um, so that was the whole beginning of the split between everybody. You know, all of a sudden I get up in the morning and I've got a text from Skip and it says, you know, we no longer want to work with you and all that. You know, you're too rash and you do, you know, you're a loose cannon and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, don't understand that. <laughs> so I go to uh, Reddit and Matt Collins has put a post out um, on behalf of the group, you know, saying, um, Rick Snay, you know, we've, we've looked into him and he's lying. He doesn't know anyone in the families and he doesn't talk to anyone. He doesn't get good information and all this kind of crap. And it was all lies. And I was like, oh, well, you know, I started, I tried to respond to it. And it said unable to post. I'm like, what the hell? I kept trying, unable to post. I'm like, what's going on here? You know, and I can't remember how I figured it out. But I was banned in Libby and Abby. I was like, you got to be kidding me, you know. So I go to uh, Delphi Docs, banned there too. I was like, are you kidding me? What did I do? You know, later found out the master troll asked her to ban me and also asked Zanaxarita to ban me over there. Now it's funny that I outlasted both of them, isn't it? Anyway, when I first went back on YouTube, okay, I had made those two videos for DP and shit, right? But before that, guys, the most viewed video I had was a video I did on Obamacare, which had like a thousand views. And I had a video on there of my daughter dancing or something at the this Beatles imitator thing. I had a video of my brother-in-law, you know, shanking a, a drive at when we were golfing. Um, a couple of me singing stuff. That's it. You know, I had maybe, if I had 5,000 views, I'd be shocked, you know. And I put up the Daniel Pearson videos, you know. Those were pretty well viewed. But yet I still didn't see myself as a channel or a creator or anything like that. So then... Um, this all happened and I was like locked out of Reddit, still banned or still in Facebook jail, stuff like that. Not the original Facebook jail is another term. Um, and I had nowhere else to go. So I went to YouTube to vent and people liked it. They were like, yeah, you know, I just vented, you know, I was so pissed and I just put everything out there that I knew. Um, and they just, you know, people liked it. So then they started asking me when my next video was. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> so I started making these videos talking about stuff. And the main thrust, I was calling it Delphi Full Court Press. And the main thrust was, I still believed at that time that, that Daniel Pearson was the killer. And the main thrust of the channel was to try to unnerve him and try to get him to confess or try to get him to slip up somehow or something like that. So that was the approach. And it was still entertainment because at the beginning, <clears throat> um, the humor, where that first came from, I was kind of talking to AASB, as above, so below. And um, we were on good terms. And I was telling him, yeah, I like your stuff. You know, it's pretty cool. And he used to have this habit in all of his videos. Every one of his videos started like this. Delphi. You know, he'd say Delphi. And then he'd, like, start talking. So that's why when you watch that parody thing I did of him, at the beginning of it, he goes, <coughs> Delphi. You know. Um, where that came from is 
when he started posting the pictures and saying, see, you can see Libby right here and she's got a hatchet in her head and here's Daniel Pearson with the video camera and all that. I was like, ah, dude, can't go there with you. I'm not seeing that. Sorry. You know, and that's all I said. I said, I appreciate you, dude. Still, still, still my buddy and all, but I can't go there with you. And he was furious. He just went off on me. I was like, are you kidding me? He just, blah, 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 you know, all kinds of stuff, you know, what do you, what do you do, Rick, <laughs> you know? So I responded with humor when I was taking on the, what I was calling back then in my ignorance, the, uh, what was I calling them? Oh, uh, the social media whores. <laughs> um, the people that were making money off of the case and everything the way I saw it. Um, and like I said, now I realize how much work it is to do a YouTube channel. Nobody's going to work for free. If people enjoy what you're doing, you should get paid for it. You know, um, but see, that's just, I don't, you know, I've been wrong so many times, you know, <laughs> anyway, that's another point about me, guys. I'm not afraid to change direction when I'm wrong. I'm not afraid to say, you know what? I've been wrong and change direction. All right. Now, on with the show. Um, so I did Little Joe. That's the one where I did the kangaroo, the buff kangaroo, you know, and I said, you know, I've been working out and I feel pretty buff. And uh, at the end of it, I said something like, now I'm going to go eat some shit and Vegemite. I lied. I don't like Vegemite, you know, stuff like that. People loved it. They ate it up. They laughed. You know, it's funny stuff. Then I finally talked to, and I'm not going to name him. I finally talked to the person who gave the linguistics report to Jeff Burton. And I said, dude, what is this thing? He said, it's nothing. It's just the contents of Libby's phone. What they had done. They had taken snippets of conversation that were in this report because for one reason or another, and they had changed it into this whole narrative. There was one person saying um, something like, um, uh, be nice if you tell him. And the other person saying, tell him yourself. Okay. But this wasn't even, this this could have been a conversation that was on there from like a month before or something like that. Well, it couldn't be a month before because there was a reset, but it was most likely something the girls were talking back and forth saying. Um, but to Jeff Burton, it was Daniel Pearson coming up to Libby because remember, there's two Daniel Pearsons and one of them was the one we refer to as the meth head Daniel Pearson. And the other one didn't do meth. <laughs> the one that was the meth head was not the Daniel Pearson that was at the bridge that day. No support with stuff. It was a, just a report. I'd scratch my back here. Oh, I hate that. It was a report like, you know, um, it was like, I think it was mostly in pictures, but they were pictures of documents and they had all these like different vowel sounds from different dialects and stuff and all these pictures from the phone and uh, things like that. And they were looking up like Prince when Prince died. They were looking that stuff up, you know, so. Um, and I started figuring out that none of this stuff made any sense. That if this report was not a conversation between meth head Daniel Pearson, who had been like screwed over by Libby's meth dealing dad somehow, and they had an argument on the bridge. That was the theory, see, that Daniel Pearson approached Libby and said, you know, um, hey, I need to talk to your dad. And Libby was like, so? And he said, so it'd be nice if you'd tell him. And she shoved Daniel Pearson and said, tell him yourself. And then he shoved her back and she fell off the hill. And then he told Abby, you know, oh, my God, we can help her, but we got to go down the hill. You know, so that's where the down the hill came from. In the theory. So he gets down there and he kills Abby too, right? Hakamak, you know. 
Um, so I started questioning that too. So then I started looking up and asking people for the original posts from the, the group Bridge of Lies, because that group, a lot of the central theories and stuff were coming from that group early on that and that uh, I can't remember the name of it right now. Somebody might drop it in the chat here. Uh, some kind of true crime message board. Now, at that time, <clears throat> I had had the friction with AASB, right? We all know Skip was mad at me. Jeff was mad at me. I had Matt Collins stalking me. He came to my house a couple of times and vandalized it in the middle of the night. Can you believe that? Drove from freaking Dayton, Ohio to vandalize my house. Turn around and go back home. <laughs> uh, what's sad is all the waste of time that if crime scene photos were even somewhat honest, they never offer. Are, are, Georgia Jakes, are, are you saying that if they would have followed what they saw in the crime scene photos, that they would have never given up on the Odinism thing? Is that what you're saying? The North? I mean, that's my that's my feeling. Anyway, now, <laughs> don't worry, sport with stuff. I chased him off. Um, yes, if we would have known. There you go. Yeah, that's the thing, guys. That's the reason I put those diagrams out there, why I told people what I saw in those pictures. You know, any other trial, we'd probably already have those pictures out by now. You know. Once it's put into discovery, everybody's going to know it. And it's just, it's pointless for them to have hid all this information from everybody. Stupid. I don't get it. Anyway, so then um, Curly, some of you might remember Curly. Uh, Curly had, I, you know, everybody wanted me to do a live stream. I wasn't able to do a live stream yet. I think I had to have a channel for so long or something like that. Um, and I couldn't figure out the system, what was going on. So Curly invited me to come on his live stream. So I did. I did two live streams with him. And then he started putting up these, like, pictures from the crime scene that were supposed to be Libby. It wasn't. Then she started, he started putting up this picture that was supposed to be Kagan Klein hanging out with... Uh, the mayor, Evans, and uh, Cody Patty in college. Like, Cody Patty went to college with the mayor and Kagan Klein. All right. So, anyway, so I I called him out on it. I said, I, would, I said, dude, that, that's not Libby, you know. So, he'd take it down. Then I'd say, dude, that's not, you know, <laughs> whatever he would put up. He always wanted to be first, so he put it up. Look at this. I got this. Um then he did his spirit box thing. And I said, dude, come on. <laughs> a spirit box. And that really offended him, I think. So he started trolling me. And then, you know, um, Holly. <laughs> but I was one of the first and only creators to be screaming at the top of my lungs, it's not the Kleins. As a matter of fact, Kristen, uh, Kristen behind the door, uh, she called me out on her program once because she was saying, if you can't accept that this is where uh, law enforcement is looking right now, then I can't help you. You know, um, but I was saying, hey, it's not the Kleins, you know, for a long time. So when I announced I was going to be at one of Kagan's hearings in Peru, I got a Facebook message from uh, Tony Klein. See, I had briefly spoke to Tony on Facebook Messenger a few months before because he was mutual friends with the guy I used to work with that now worked with him, see? 
So I saw him. I was like, hey, I know that dude, man. Yeah, he's pretty cool. So, hey, I just want to let you know that I don't think you're a killer and I don't think your son is either. Right. And then he just told me a few things like, yeah, you know, I went to the I've given him DNA and I've, you know, passed a polygraph. I was like, okay. So I left him alone. Well, he sent me a Facebook message that morning. He said, hey, I see you're going to be in Peru. He says, would you do me a favor? He says, here's my number. Could you could you call or text me? So I think I texted him and he uh, texted me back and he said, you know, yeah, can you meet me in Peru? I got a doctor's appointment. And I said, yeah, that's the way I'll go back home. I'll meet you in Peru you know, or I mean in uh, Kokomo because he had a doctor's appointment in Kokomo. He asked me will I meet him in Kokomo. I said, sure. Yeah, I'll do that. He said he wanted to talk to me. So I go to Kokomo after the trial, after the hearing, I drive you know, to Kokomo and I see his car sitting there. So I pull up next to him. I get out, I get into the car and I'm not in the presence of this fierce looking guy with the, the you know, the hair and everything and the, and the grins and everything. He's very uncomfortable in front of a camera guys. That's why he always looks, you know, like he's, you know, <laughs> um, but, or sometimes he's even mugging for it too. But I get into the car and this guy is like totally a different person than I pictured him as. And his voice even is such a soft voice and stuff, you know, and he's and he just he was crying about, you know, he said, I don't know what to do anymore. My life is destroyed, you know, and he said, I just I really appreciate that, you know, you stick up for me and everything, you know. And I told him, I said, you know what? I said, I'll do it even more now, dude. You know, I, I said, is, I, I, I'm telling you, I hate what they did to you, you know. So um, I got to know him over time. And what really accelerated our friendship was um, when he had the surgery to remove the one leg and everything, they kept having complications, having to remove more and more and everything. Um, he was an indie. And. I would drive up there and see him, you know, not too many of his family and friends could come very often. So I would drive up there and see him, you know, just visit with him, sit in the room and tell jokes and laugh and talk and stuff. And, uh, you know, um, I just got to know him and I liked him. So Holly was the one who was trying to, she, was trying to get her way into the community by trading on her the fact that she was one of the women that was talking to Kagan while he was in jail. She was trying to get him to turn in. She thought he knew who the killer was. See, there were different stories for everybody that was talking to Kagan. He told him what they wanted to hear. Holly was telling him stuff like, I'll sell my car and bail you out of jail, but you got to turn in these guys. Tell them what you know. Okay. Um, she was telling everyone that the reason she was talking to him is because her daughter had been catfished by him and she was trying to find out the deal. But then she changed and said that she was catfished, not by Kagan, but by someone in his group. Okay. Now, shortly after that, she got thrown out of as above, so below's chat. So she ended up in mine and she was telling all these stories. Right. Then it was right about that time, I believe, when Richard Allen was arrested and everybody was like, ah, Holly, you said that, you know, that it was Kagan and Klein and all that. And she said, no, I said it was part of his group. And Richard is part of his group, you know, and she claimed to know him. She claimed to uh, have had him on her Facebook, you know, years before and knew that he was the killer all along, was trying to get Kagan to roll on him and stuff like that, right? So I said, well, hang on. Everybody was jumping all over Holly. And I said, hang on a minute, guys. Give her a chance, you know? And I said, Holly, if you can back up what you're saying, I will let you come on here with me. I will have you on as a guest, and you can tell your story. So I would, you know, email her, or I would text her. She gave me her number to text her. So I would text her and then she would say, oh, I never got a text. And I was like, OK, so I text her again. Oh, I never got a text. So I was like, huh? So then I said, OK, let's talk on email. So I emailed her twice before she finally emailed me back. And then she had just like these very bare essential things that were proof of nothing. 
And because she has this habit of putting black marks through everything that she posts, um, it was nuts because um, she would put something up and expect it to be proof, but everything's blacked out. So then I asked her a few questions. I said, okay, so this person here, this work ID that you're showing me, that would be your ex. And then he's the father of your daughter that was catfished, right? See, I wanted to find out if that's what the deal was because then I want to talk to him too, see? She turned that into me telling her I wanted her daughter's information. <laughs> no, I never said that. And the only time I ever said anything about threatening her with stuff, she kept telling lies about me. And I sent her the first page of an intelligence report or intelligence or whatever it is. And it had some names and some, you know, for people in her family. And she was like, you know, oh, he put these names out. And no, I only sent them to her. And I told her, stop lying about me or I'll just put them up on the internet. Now, I never would have done that. It was a bluff. You know, anyway. So about that time is when I shut down uh, Full Court Press and became, when I reemerged, I became Delphi After Dark. Now, the focus of the channel has changed quite a bit from the beginning to now, because in the beginning, remember, it was to bring attention to the case, okay? Then it became looking at who could have possibly done this. I looked at Ron Logan for a long time. So many things lined up, and yes, this time. This time I ver verified things. This time, I, you know, one of the things I look at is the work done by Lois Gibson, the forensic artist for the uh, FBI. So this time, rather than trust that Lois Gibson did this, I contacted her and I talked to her. And she said, yes. Okay. Instead of just believing or, you know, accepting that this is what Nicole Robertson said. I think that was her name. I contacted her. I talked to her. Okay. I contacted and talked to the other one. I can't quite remember the one that put the, the, uh, the post up somewhere. What was that uh, woman's name? The guys helped me out here. The other FBI agent. One people hate her now, I think, for something. I'm not sure. Anyway, blonde woman. Um, she's retired, I think, from the FBI. Um, talk to her. Um, when I had questions about something that Kagan had said to Barbara McDonald, I talked to Barbara. So I verified these things. And I believed at that point that Ron Logan if he was not the killer, that for at the very least, he helped them somehow. Because I'm convinced, just like Lois Gibson was, that the person in the picture, the person in the video is Ron Logan. What I'm not convinced of is that the person in the video is the person who kidnapped Okay. Because we now have the confessions of Elvis Costello. No, of Elvis Fielder. 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 Fields. What, what's his name, damn it? Anyway, Elvis, EF. We have his confession. Okay. He says he was the guy on the bridge. He gave his sister a blue jacket. All right. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, I really don't. But he says he was there with somebody else, too. So maybe the other one was Ron Logan. Everything about this case, everything about this crime has been used to point in different directions. They got sidetracked with this being a sexually motivated crime because one of the victims was nude. So everybody thinks this was a pervert that did this. And they think that Richard Allen is that pervert. Okay. 
let's find any proof whatsoever that Richard Allen is a pervert, a sexual pervert so depraved that he would kill two girls just to get his jollies. Show me anything in his past that makes him that person. Other details, Georgia, that I don't know about that. <laughs> the details, because think about this. We already know, we already know for a fact, okay, that, oh, <laughs> that they lied about uh, Betsy Blair's statements, and we know for a fact they lied about uh, what's her name, Sarah Carbaugh. She they added bloody to muddy. She said he was muddy and looked like he'd been in a fight. So I guess Tony Liggett thought, oh well, if he was in a fight, then he would be bloody. So I'll just put that in there. You know, now we already know they lied about that one thing. Every single thing that they are using to make Richard Allen look like the suspect comes from that PCA. They have no DNA. Oh, I see what you're saying there. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying, Georgia Jakes. <laughs> they have no DNA. They have nothing that, you know, no blood, nothing connects him to the scene. So, you know, Georgia Jakes is completely right. <laughs> How did he know details like that, guys? Believe me, I saw the pictures. Okay. Don't try to tell me that he inaccurately described those pictures. I saw them. He described, or the crime scene, actually. I saw them, and they were not available to him a couple of days after the murders. Okay. He knew about that crime scene. How? How? Why was he so scared? And why? You know. You already know you have this guy where you want him. Why the hell don't you put him under the big light with Jimmy Stewart there? You know, and all right, Shaney, you know. James Cagney, whoever that was. <laughs> that dog don't hunt. That dog refuses to shop at Walmart so he can't find a nice alarm clock for cheap. And dogs don't have a lot of money. So he oversleeps the hunt every day. That dog don't hunt. Now, that brings us to where we're at today. Why, why would a man come on here on YouTube and tell you that his wife has left him, you know, things like that. I'll tell you why. I, now this is going to shock some of you, I have not always been a good person. And I do feel like I'm a good person now. I do. You know, I have not always been a good person. There are some things I did that I really regret. There are people I hurt that I regret hurting. Um, some of it was done as a uh, part of like um, the political career so, sort of thing. You know, I've told you guys before that I've been into oppo research, you know, and I don't want to get into a lot of detail, but I did a lot of things that, that could be considered unethical because that was my job. And that's what I did, you know, and I look back on it now and I think 
did I have to compromise my morals that much for money? And if I did, was it worth it? And look where I'm at today. I, mean, I love this house. I hope I can keep it. But you know what? I got to find a job. I got to find a big boy job. <laughs> I got some prospects. Something's going to happen. But what am I doing here? What about my Patreon? I'm, go I'm going to do it no matter what. Thank you, Mark Collins. That's all I ask. And I agree. And I'm the same with you, my friend. Now. The whole thing with my wife, guys, let's not make it something it's not, okay? I'm, I'm hard to live with, you know, especially now, especially now. If you think this is bad, you should have seen some of the presidential campaigns I've worked on <laughs> getting right down to the wire. Um, but the reason for this, guys, is I'm passionate. All right. You know why? I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> Do you know why I have issues now with um, traditional jobs and working and so forth? I'll tell you. When I was a younger man, I held a job for 15 years. I always had a job. I always worked. Um, when I first got that job that I had for 15 years, I was working like 70, 80 hours a week. The only, the first couple of months I worked there, the only eight hour day I worked was a Sunday. Um, you know, not lazy. Uh, my problem is that I have a hard time now really giving something my best effort if I don't believe in it. That's why I'm looking at, um, now I got my bartender's license and bartenders can be very important. And I've noticed that now. I want to explain to you what I mean. A bartender can notice when somebody is getting a little too drunk and they can cut them off, make them drink water, make them eat some food, you know, make sure that they sober up a little before they leave. Now, another thing a bartender can do is ask, hey, you're not driving, are you? You know, and I even have bartenders that will watch. If they see them walk out to the car, they'll go, Rick, and tell me to go get them. You know, so. <clears throat> um, as I said, I'm very hard to live with. And, I, and I'm not going to downplay it, Georgia. And I'll tell you what, it is hard. It is hard. I love her, guys. I love her. We don't hate each other, though. We're a little upset with each other. You know, we're getting to that point where we're working on money issues and things like that. But I'm not going to rule out that I'll ever get back with her. I think she has. But you never know. Um, it's just when I get involved in something that I really, really believe in, I go at it. And sometimes I don't know where the line is. You know, it's hard. It's hard to maintain that balance. But you know what it does for me? I often have people point out that I'm old. They call me that all the time in the bar. You know, what are you going to do, old man? With age comes experience, and with experience comes knowledge and wisdom, okay? The Native Americans had it right. When your elders get old, don't put them in a nursing home or whatever. Don't ignore them. Put them on a chair and let them dispense their wisdom while they're still around. That's the whole thing. I've learned, guys. I've learned what it's all about. You know? Love Laura, and she can't live with me, at least not right now. 
So the best thing I can do is let her go. Let her do her thing. Same thing I told you about my daughters. I'm not going to hold them to me. If they're better off without me, let them go. You know? But I got a lot to offer in these remaining decades. Um, I got a lot to offer, you know, because I do have a lot of knowledge. I have lived for a long time. My head is packed with useless knowledge and useful knowledge. So that's what this Patreon is going to be all about. It's going to be about the context and critical thinking that you need to figure things out in life before it's too late. And it's going to be dispensed to you by someone who knows the theory and the subject very well, because I've dispensed it far too late in a lot of freaking areas. <laughs> it's hard to look at yourself. All the psychology I took, I always tend to analyze other people and I usually nail it. But then I just, I, I have a hard time looking at myself. It takes me longer, but I do get there. You know, and again, I've done a lot of things I feel sorry about. A lot of things I want to apologize for. A lot of things I have to, I feel like I have to make up for. And that's why, you know, I've looked at life and the closest thing that I see to a religion that I could actually get something from and believe in is Buddhism. And I've looked at it extensively. And one of the things that I've picked up from that, okay, is when you reach a certain point in your life where you realize I can't go any further with this, you set it down. You may come back to it someday. You know? But you set it down. Because it's more important for you to keep going than it is to carry that. Now, karma. I look at that as a slate. I look at it as a ledger. Okay? And I feel like, I don't know what's you know, I can tell you what I think happens after life, but you probably won't like it. Um, but I really don't know, do I? You know, so if there is an afterlife, I don't feel like I should enter it as a person who still has bread in that ledger. I want to make up for that. You know what I mean? I want to do something that I feel in my heart is the right thing to do, no matter what anyone else tells me, you know, and that's been a big part of what this has been about from the very beginning for me. But now I look at it and I say, why did I expect it to be easy? Hey, Dean, everybody's been there, brother. Me more than once. <laughs> I'm horrible with money. Horrible with money. That's why I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. But listen. It's not supposed to be easy. It's not. And everything that's happening to me now my own choice, uh, decisions I've made. Have they all been good? Nah. <laughs> would I take some of them back? Oh, you bet. But I wouldn't take back the lessons I've learned. I wouldn't take back one minute. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I said that I wish I'd never asked Laura to sing with me that night. I wouldn't get back one minute of the time I spent with her as my wife or my girlfriend or whatever. She was a joy to be around. 
Everybody loves her. You know that. And to think, she tells me now she can't even imagine ever being with a man, you know, because she's been so turned off by relationships, you know, because of how I turned out, basically. It's just an example, guys, of how I tried hard to leave that old life behind. Something kept calling me. Something kept nagging me. Something kept telling me, you're not good enough yet. You don't deserve this woman. You don't deserve this life. Something kept nagging me. And I knew I could never just walk away from this thing. And you know the day I knew that, or the day that I look back now and realize that's the point at which I knew there was no turning back, but I didn't know it at the time, right? And this will be a very prominent, it like opens the book. <clears throat> yeah, we don't need any religion, guys. Let's leave your religion out. Now, let's leave your religion out, please. Um, when you... <clears throat> Where was I at, guys? I thought, oh, we're, yeah. The, what's going to open the book is a prologue that talks about the day that I walked into the courtroom to lay my eyes on that filthy, dirty scumbag that had killed those two girls. You know, that guy in his mug shots, you know, where he's, you know, and everything. And I thought, uh, you know, uh -huh. And sitting there, you know, and I'm all, I was talking to Anya and Kevin on this side of me, and they bring these people in, you know, two women. And they sit down, and Anya kind of tugs on my sleeve, and I looked over, and she goes, that's Richard Allen's mom and his wife. And I was like, oh. And I looked, <laughs> and I was sitting right next to um, Kathy Allen. Now, when <clears throat> the when they brought him in, they had him, you know, shackled, and he came in, and I was trying to like see him. I'm looking around and everything, and then finally. He gets like, he's like three feet from me and I look and a lot of people say the first thing they noticed was how short he was, how small he is. First thing I noticed is he was terrified. He was looking like he expected someone to jump out and stab him. Okay. Um, he was looking around for a friendly face, his mom and his wife. He was hoping they were there. And the way his mom and his wife reacted when they saw him, uh, I, I, other people that, well, one other person that was there has talked about crocodile tears and how fake it was and all that kind of stuff. And I didn't see that way. You know, I, I saw it as it was, um, she was devastated, devastated. When she saw him, it was even worse. She just, you know. And then we get shortly after that, the PCA is unsealed and what did we find out we found out that the dots don't connect they don't 
you can't polish a turd, guys. This thing is a turd. <laughs> no. The dots don't connect. The only thing we have that says this is the guy is Tony Liggett's word. Based on Dan Doolin's word. Oh, no, wait a minute. No, it's Tom Skinner's word, who's dead. That's all we got, guys. <laughs> so that's where we're at, right? The difference that I saw in Kathy from that day to when I saw her in court that day I was thrown out, you know, I, I approached her and, you know, knelt down and she saw me and she just smiled. And I just saw this, I saw hope in her face for the first time ever. She smiled real big and she grabbed my hands and squeezed and she said, thank you. To think that I helped do that. I, I can't stop. I was one of the first people saying, hold on, no, this guy didn't do it. The day I was like revealing little bits and pieces of the Odinism thing that I was getting from you know who. The day the Odinism story broke, the day they dropped that 136-page document is the day I was being interviewed for Crime Nation. And they actually recorded my reaction live from reading that. And I was overwhelmed. I was like, you know, oh, <laughs> yeah, this is confirming a lot of stuff I've been saying. And that's where it was. Now, that's why I can't walk away, guys, because I helped put that hope in Kathy's eyes. I helped put that smile on her face. I'm helping Rick get through a prison term that he you know, hasn't been sentenced to by writing to him, things like that. You know, I don't talk about the case. I don't mention court, you know, things like that. I just talk about baseball, you know, general events. Remember this when you were a kid type stuff. You know. Now, moving on. <laughs> As the Patreon unfolds, okay, the whole point of it is going to be looking at various subjects and adding a context to it that people may not have looked at before. Okay. Um, <clears throat> kind of like everybody knows, well, I don't know about everybody, some people may not know, but a lot of people know, especially people my age know, that the president that ordered they gave the order to drop the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the atomic and the hydrogen. Um, that president was Harry S. Truman, who had not really been president that long, and really, I don't think, ever expected to be president. If you put that into context, really start to understand how this man felt being given the choice, you know, being given the, you know, or the, 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 what do you call it? The, uh, duty being given this responsibility of unleashing this thing on the world. At that point, remember, nobody even knew if it could work a nuclear weapon. Nobody knew.
And that's context. That changes things for people, you know? So we're going to do that. And we're going to use that context not to divide, but to try and find a mutual understanding about different things. It's going to be highly uh, audience driven. A lot of it's going to depend on conversation with the audience, that sort of thing. But we're going to learn together. We're going to laugh. We're going to have exam. You know, we're going to have humorous stuff like we always do. And some of it will be completely humorous. We'll have like a whole, might even have a whole sketch thing going. I don't know. But the point is, guys, when you come to this uh, Patreon, you're not just going to be getting content. You're also going to be getting skills. You're going to learn stuff that you never imagined, you know. And you're going to look at the world in a whole different way. You may change your mind on certain subjects. You may not. But at least you're going to get to explore what your belief is and what someone else's belief is. So hopefully we can do that without too much conflict. <laughs> All right, guys, I got to get out of here. I'm hungry. I want to make my pizza. But uh, I do know that uh, we have been uh, dropping the Lucci's link. I got the Lucci's shirt on here. L-U-C-C-I. Look them up on Facebook. Great people. If you can help them out financially, please do. Um, if you can't, you know, not everybody can. You can help them out by sharing their stuff on Facebook, um, especially trying to find people. We need fosters. We need adopters. we got to get some of these dogs out of there. We can't take in any more dogs. You know, it's hard. It really is. So um, let's see if we can help them out. You know, um, if you've ever been thinking about adopting a dog, <laughs> if you're local, you can stop in and like visit the dogs, have a play date, take them for a walk. Do whatever you want. Just sit with them, read to them, something like that. You know, give them some human contact. Try and relieve some of the stress of being in that pen, you know. So that's why we do it, folks. So, okay, guys, um, I want to thank my mods tonight. I, you know, guys, I, I, and, and there's nobody there's nobody understands it more than than me, guitarista. Um, you know, I'm an atheist. I, I admit it. Um, but... That's just me. That's just what I think. You know, <laughs> I'm not going to argue with you about it. You know, um, I don't want to try to convince you. And I don't think you should try to want to convince me, you know. But anyway, um, I thank my mods for showing up tonight. Did a great job. I'm very, very happy about that. Uh, I will um, have another live stream coming up real soon. I, I've got interviews and stuff scheduled, and uh, I don't know how this week's going to go, but I, I know we're going to have at least another uh, couple of live streams this week. So um, I got some catching up to do since I had that little allergy issue. But uh, so thanks for coming out, everybody. I appreciate it. If you're new, I hope you come back. I hope you subscribe. Give us a like on the uh, stream today. And remember, guys, until I see you again, I wish you peace, love, love, and peace. Take it easy, folks.